Hey, y'all, and welcome back to another episode of Catch That, where we break down R&B albums, eras, and just history of R&B with folks that are super knowledgeable and really love the culture. I am Naturally Elise, and that is my brother. JR. And we are the R&B representatives. And today, we are welcoming Mr. Matthew Allen, award-winning journalist, um, that decided to slum it with us today. Hey, brother. Hey, guys. I'm so, so excited about being here. I'm a big follower of the show, big fan, and I am ready to go. Yes. Or, as, or, as, or as Wanda would say, I am ready to go. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yes. Well, before we jump into um, any discussion, how about you tell folks about yourself as little or as much as you would like to share? Oh, no problem. Well, I'm a Gemini from Syracuse, New York. I like long walks on the beach. I like putting whipped cream on top of my chocolate pudding cups. And I am a bona fide sugar addict. And sometimes in between each serving of chocolate ice cream and Reese's peanut butter cups, I write articles about music. You can read some of them in thegrill.com, Ebony, Jet, The Root, and okay player yes so jr yes how about you tell the folks what are we going to be talking lord i can't talk what we are going to be talking about yes and why you think it's important that we talk about it okay y'all so today we will be discussing the jackson's destiny album and i'm so glad that we're talking about this with matthew because he is a diehard fan, for real. And this album is very important to him. And we're going to get into this because, like he said, he wrote an article, which was an amazing article. You felt them. It was awesome. And I'm telling you, we're going to really get into why, like, if this album is very important to him. It really saved his life and all of that. And I'm a fan of him for the longest on Twitter. I was following him on Twitter before he started following me. Because that's how much of a fan I am. <laughs> like, I've been reading his articles, <laughs> the one he did on The Root, the ones that he did on Grills. Like, I'm a fan. And then I'm a fan of the Get Out the Fence podcast that he has, where he talks about um, each of the albums or whether to get off the fence. Not get out. Get off the fence. And um, like, he goes back and forth with different albums and things like that. And he actually did um, an episode uh, with uh, Triumph vs. Destiny, and it was such a good episode. And then he's done, um, you know, Stevie, which was so funny, y'all. People be getting real. Like, they be getting mad. <laughs> so they be thinking, like, it's hilarious, but it's so knowledgeable. You learn some stuff. Cause I, it's some stuff I didn't even know. You know what I'm saying? And he did a Janet episode, and I'm a big Janet fan, and I was sitting there like, damn, I didn't know that. Uh-uh, I, knew, I know where you're going, ma'am. I know where you're going. Watch it. But <laughs> I'm such a big fan, so I'm learning. So I'm such a fan because he's so knowledgeable of music and all that. So for him to pick this album and know how important it is to him, I'm just ready really to get into it. So y'all, y'all know how we do here. I'm not going to go back to the Jackson 5, y'all. We're not going to do that because it's like, you know, all that good stuff. So I want to say to you, Matthew, what did you feel when it be, when they became the Jacksons like you your introduction to them how'd you feel about it and all that good stuff so mm -hmm. so I always knew that they turned into the Jacksons um from when I was a little kid I mean I knew that when I was a little kid I knew that Michael Jackson and the Jackson five I knew that they were the Jacksons because I was born in 1982 this year that thriller came out so by the time I was three, that was about when We Are the World is happening, the end of the Victory Tour. I knew what the Victory Tour was. Um, so I knew that there was that they were the Jacksons. They changed into the Jacksons. I knew about Shake It By Down to the Ground. I knew about the Can You Feel It and all those songs and Torture because that video is legitimately more scary than the Thriller video. Um, <laughs> it is. It is. Um, so, but I didn't know about like, exactly the trajectory that they took until much later my uh dear dear big sister tiffany real uh she gave me she gifted me 
the cassette tape of the Jackson self-titled album from 1976 produced by Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff that I had oh, no man. idea it existed. And then I was stupefied how brilliant and amazing it was. And then I found out about Going Places, its follow-up, which is a very, very underappreciated record. Um, then, then that led into Destiny. And then Destiny, like I, like you said, I wrote an article on my Substack um, a couple of weeks ago that really highlighted how Destiny came into my life at a very crucial point um, in my early adolescence because you know there were certain songs on it, but besides the hits that really spoke to me in a time that I really needed to hear it, and we will talk more about that later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jr.? Well, for me, you know. Um, I was happy when I when they got with Gamble and Huff, to be honest with you, because with me being such a fan of them on Motown, because Motown is my favorite label, y'all. I say yeah. that all the time. But the guys were not able to be artists. So finally, when they got to Gamble and Huff, they were able to kind of, kind of, they were able to just kind of shine a little bit. And they were not that bubble gum anymore. They changed them from that bubble gum that Motown wanted to keep them there to what they did so like enjoy yourself and show me the way to go and you could tell like even doing them live performances how Michael was just he felt different he felt comfortable he felt a little bit more free you know what I'm saying so it was like he was studying what was going on you know what I mean and I it's a favorite Jackson album of mine to be honest because I'm I'm a fan of Gamble and Huff anyway but um it's just and, and then we talked about keep on dancing with Neil he did a, a, a Catch That Many with Keep On Dancing. It's like that album was just so grown. And I love how everybody says, like how New Edition did, you know, with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis going into Heartbreak, and it made mm -hmm. them be grown. And it's exactly what this Jackson's album did in 1976. It made them become grown. You know what I'm saying? It was no more of that Motown bubblegum no more. So I think it was great for them anyway, because then if they didn't do an album like that, we wouldn't have gotten Destiny, to be honest, because they were not, they, they were real artists with Destiny. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So I was just so happy that they got with Gamble and Huff and all that, because, and now, now I gotta ask you a question too. Is it true that a whole album of theirs was done with Stevie or is that just a rumor? Okay. This is legitimately the holy grail okay. topic for me. Okay. So there is an article, and, and, and it exists, this is true. There is an article um, in which someone reported on Michael Jackson working in the studio at Stevie Wonder circa 1974 on a solo album, a potential Michael Jackson solo album that would have followed up the Music and Me album from 1973. Mm -hmm. This is around the time the Jackson 5 were recording with Stevie for his for his first finale album. They were the background singers on You Can't um You Haven't Done Nothing which was done nothing. number 1. Mm -hmm. And so the so you guys know that very infamous picture of Stevie at the board with Michael looking over his looking, shoulder. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. As yes. a teenager. That picture was taken for that article. In the article, they explained that Stevie's going to produce an album for Michael, and then after that, he's going to do one for Jermaine. And one single was about to be released, which was released, which was a song called Buttercup. Um, it was later uh, re-recorded by another artist in the 80s, um, but the album never came to fruition. Jermaine's album did, which became Let's Get Serious, but the nobody ever heard anything else from that michael album michael said a few months before thriller drop that he did do the album but motown shelved it and they're and they're waiting to put it out for some reason or whatever um marlon jackson said on quest love supreme that they did record that material with stevie in that time so i know the album has to exist somewhere because marlon said that they recorded records Michael said that they recorded records. Um, Stevie hasn't talked about it, but I would love to just believe that it does exist and it's somewhere. Um, right. I have some sources that say Stevie has it and hopefully he doesn't because I heard another rumor that he's going to burn all his, his unreleased stuff once he passes away. 
Oh. Um, so I definitely want to break into his vault and steal some things before. <laughs> yeah, like, right. So so it's so I I think it is true. I know that there's some is to material that exists. It might not be put into a sequence or anything, but there's material that exists from that for sure. Yeah, because I asked that because again with them becoming artists, come on, they working with Stevie. They would have definitely got some stuff from him, and you know. What I mean? I'm saying it definitely would have been, you know, definitely different. So I was just like, damn, if they would have got that album out, but Motown was just hating by that time. And that's why they was like, we out. Like, we out. Like, we, we've we had enough. You know what I mean? And then to get the deal with Philly and all that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, things are supposed to happen how they happen. You know what I mean? So they did two albums with Gambling yeah. Up, and then they were able to do this Destiny album. But, you know, that's why I wanted to ask. Exactly. Yeah. And I swear, labels, when they have kid acts, they either try to keep them bubblegum forever or they try to make them too grown out the gate. Like, that's not like a man. <laughs> yes. Or they don't let them, like, progress in that kind of a natural way. And a lot of that's the audience, too. Sometimes the audience don't want to let you grow, too. So, but mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's very, very true. true. Mm -hmm. And I'm just glad that once they did those two albums, because like you said, going places is a little bit underrated, too, in a way. Mm -hmm. In a way. <laughs> yeah, go and play. Find me a girl is a damn good song. Find me a girl, great, great closer. Um, even though you're gone is great. Uh, Man of War, which is really like, I heard Michael once said that he wished that it was it would have been a single because Man of War is a great, great song. I just like, I mean, <laughs> I'm starting to get into it more now. But before, I used to, like, really give that album a lot of fever. Like, for real. Because the only song that I, I liked on it was Different Kind of Lady. And that's the song that they, really? they did. And it's just, like, it just had that. And you know what? When it comes to Gamble and Huff, I think that album, Going Places, gave me the traveling, speeding, like, that long shit that OJ's had. The OJ's? Yes. cover? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. It gave me that. So it's like when they started going to more into that disco lane to me, I always be like, Gamble and Huff, no, y'all stay with y'all with but, 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 but the thing is, Gamble and Huff basically invented disco. If we're gonna In be a way. truthful about it. In I a mean, way. all that a lot of that four on the floor stuff, Gamble yeah. and Huff was doing a lot of that in like mm. 73, you know, 74 area before it became like the thing. Uh, right. So, you know, I know people like want to dis disco, but Gamble and Huff really were ahead of the curve when it came to that. Yeah, yeah, them, and then they was like, cause um, what's it? Cause don't you feel like the Get It Together album kind of give you a yeah, little that was them, disco? Yeah, well, I think that yeah, Get It Together was them sort of trying to experiment and go a little mm. bit out of it because they had songs like Hum Along and Dance on there. Mm -hmm. Um, that crazy cover of Reflections, you know, <laughs> but but my jam on there is it's too late to change the time. That's absolutely, absolutely, on that record, absolutely, yes, <laughs> yes. So, so we get there, and now we get to the Destiny album, y'all. Like now we're here. Now Epic is like you guys can produce, y'all can write, y'all got kind of full control. And to me, this cover right here, because we can get into the cover first, it's powerful to me. Because when I look at this cover, I look at these guys as like, yo, we're finally doing what we were destined to do. Write our own music, produce our own stuff. And it's just powerful to me. So like, this is the, actually the first Jackson vinyl I actually copped. And I remember as a little kid, when I saw it, I was like, Yo, they look so powerful. Like, they like, you know what I'm saying? They looking strong. Like, you know what I'm saying? And then they standing on top of Destiny like, yo, we're destined to do this. You know what I'm saying? Y'all going to respect us as real artists now. So that's just one reason why I just love this cover so much. And it's actually my favorite cover from them. Because it's just a powerful cover, cover to me. So I love that cover so much. You know what's my favorite cover, though? What? Is it self-titled? Because mm -hmm. it's it's just they free they just like they just yes they look, they look happy they happy they, 
like they look genuinely happy. <laughs> like they got the cheesy, but it's sweet. I like it. But yes, yeah, it's powerful. I, yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 So we get into the first joint. Blame it on the boogie. Don't blame it on the moon. <laughs> that song. What a way to start the record off. Yes, I got yes. I got to I got to give it up to um, Mr. Greg Fillingains, um, the genius who, himself. Oh. Absolutely, he's yes. he he's the one that's really responsible for the arrangement of that record. Because, um, for all the viewers out there, for you don't know, the Jacksons. What makes this album so special is the fact that the Jacksons produced this album all themselves and wrote all of the songs except for one which was this one. This was a cover by a British artist named Mick Jackson. And so if you listen to the original version, it's pretty straightforward, but there's an element of the arrangement that Greg Villengains brought to it that is that intro, that So Greg brought that to the table. You know, mm -hmm. he used to play with Stevie Wonder in his band and his thought process was like, well, what did Stevie do in this situation? So he's really put the funk on it with that clavinet and bass combination mm -hmm. and just boom, just knocked it right out right from the start. <laughs> what, you know, go, go ahead. Go no, ahead. I'm saying what you, I saw you giggling. Oh no, because this is I, when I talk about this song, I laugh because since you know I'm about the line of those life, right? So I will realize this is actually the first album I didn't do it at first because I knew that it was written and produced by them. So mind you, I'm thinking blaming on the book. I didn't heard it so often, whatever. I think it's their record. So I am um a, a fan of Felix Hernandez from WBGO, right? And yeah, you're a New Yorker, man. You know. Um, so. I was listening to him one day and he was doing the double play. So he was like, I'm going to play, you know, so he was like, I'm going to do double plays. I'm going to play the original, then I'm going to play the thing. So then he was like, but for this one, I'm going to switch it. So he plays the Jackson Blame It on the Boogie. And I'm like, wait, wait, this a cover? Wait a minute, what? But I was like, but on the thing, it says M. Jackson. I'm like, wait a minute, hold up. I was like, wait a minute, I've been fooled. Wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. One. I was like, wait a minute. And I was like, then he played the original version. And I was like, get the hell out of here. I was like, hell no. <laughs> and I was sitting there like, Ma, did you know this was an original? She was like, no, I didn't either. I was like, what? Like, I was bugged out. Cause it's like, I always thought that this was their song. And then it said M. Jackson on it. Dick and it's Michael. That's Mick. <laughs> and now mm -hmm. that I learned, and I was like, what the fuck? Like, what the hell? And then Felix Hernandez was saying that Mick actually wanted this song to go to Stevie. He wanted it to get to Stevie first. And obviously it didn't get there. And Michael and, uh, I mean, the Jackson's management heard it. And brought it back to them and they recorded it so fast and, and come to find out that they put it out like the same day so radio stations used to go back and forth playing both of these joints and i'm so upset because i love this record and it didn't really do that well to start and this is the first single and you would think that the first single is coming out and it's gonna be like boom and this is a jam and it didn't do that well and i'm like what were people thinking back then? Like, what was wrong with y'all? Like, this single is the shit. Like, what's going on? But you know, blame it on the boogie. Uh -huh. I I've heard more people talking about that song now than I did when I was a kid. Yeah. 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 yeah I, the... I I I've always liked this one. I remember the the, the only time. Remember, this is back before the internet. This is before YouTube. The only time I was able to hear that is when I was watching Moonwalker and then there was that little snippet of those uh -huh. little songs. So the first time I heard Blame on the Boogie was in Moonwalker. That's the only time. It was That was the only time I could hear Blame on the Boogie. That was the only time I could hear State of Shock. That was it. <laughs> as, a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, this is a quick side. 
every time me and my brothers and sisters used to watch Moonwalker all the time yeah. to the point where every time you hear the song Ben, like in its real form, when it goes, you've got a friend in me, we all start singing da, 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 because that was the transition in Moonwalker. It goes straight into Dancing Machine. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I was lucky because my mama had a big record collection, um, and and we had all of these uh, Jackson's records. So I got and and I was always messing with my mama re records, as she said on the episode she was on. Oh, Absolutely, yeah, she always was in my records. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So yeah. So I, luckily, I had access that a lot of people didn't have. So um, I feel very blessed that I was able to easy access to the music. And you would think that this song is so fun. Like, it's so fun. Like, it makes you just want to just groove. You know what I'm saying? And then the breakdown, you know what I'm saying? Like, everything, it just seems right on this song. And I'm just like, damn, it could have did better than this. You know what I'm saying? But I'm like, people still rock to it now. Like you said, at least a lot of people talk about it more now than they did then. You know what I'm saying? But like you said, Greg Finland Gaines, what he did on this, it was just like him and then have Nathan on the bass and mm -hmm. then have Jerry, uh, hey, the one that did the, the arrangements of the horns. Hey, y'all, yes, I love horns. And the thing, it was just, this record was so complete. And then to be the first single, it's like they were coming at you. So you can still got people at Studio 54 rocking. So I'm like, this is a jam. Why did it peak? But... It is what it is. I wish it would have done better commercially. That's all. Yeah. So it was yeah. a yeah, it was a lot out. Then yeah, it, like, yeah. It was a lot big. Yeah, I I it would have been nice if it was um if it was if it was bigger. Um yeah. just because of the fact that it I maybe it's because of the fact that I and a lot of people have said this to me is that it still had a sort of like a, a sort of poppy bubblegumish sort of thing for that time. Yeah. yeah. So they're just thinking, okay, this is more of the yeah. same from the Jacksons, you know. Yeah. You know, because they're still, you know, they're a kid act, you know, they still need to be taken seriously. So I get why people probably like it came out of the gate and it didn't perform as well as it should have. Mm -hmm. Because some of the other stuff on here was far more innovative. You know, um um, what's my man's name from Blood, Sweat, and Tears? He was the uh sort of supervising producer and oh, AR dude. on the project. So y'all talked about that on your episode too. Yeah. Shit. <laughs> so um, so basically, um, he he reached out to like the marketing guy at Epic Records and asked yeah. them to find a song for them to cover, just to cover their bases in case. Oh well, if these kids write an album that is trash at least we have a song that's you know that's half right but so they found um they found that song and then by this time too with the fact that the jacksons they they were far in between when it came to hits by now you know what i'm saying like they needed a banger you know what i'm saying because they just had enjoy yourself yeah. And then you had uh, Show Me The Way To Go, but that was like a top 25 hit, I think a top 30. So after yeah, that- that was like 23 on the charts. Yeah. So by then it's like, now they need something. And then you would think this would did it, but we know what song did. Yeah, yeah. It, it, but you, exactly. But Yeah. But you know what? Like going back to your point, Matthew, yeah. no, if you, we, we love this song. But it is very bubblegum. Like that's feel like a kid at a at an amusement park. Dun, dun, dun. That's what I think of. <laughs> like it just makes me happy, but it's very poppy. And I, mm -hmm. I feel the same way about enjoying yourself. Yeah. It's fun. It's not a diss, but it is mm -hmm. very it has that poppy kind of well, kind of well, kid adjacent. Think is more... Not kiddish, but kid. What do you adjacent. think is more? What do you think is more poppy? Do you think is, Enjoy Yourself is more poppy or do you think Blame It on the Boogie is more poppy? Blame It on the Boogie. I think. No. no. Really? No. I th enjoy <laughs> Yourself because it's... Enjoy Yourself. It's a little it's, more stripped down than... Because yeah. at least Blame It on the Boogie is thick. Like musically very thick. Yeah. And layers. that's no shade to Gamble and Huff. But, but at that point, I mean, pop music sort of 
formulated itself around them. Mm -hmm. So Joy Yourself, that was pretty like just, you know, because that's like their peak in terms of their songwriting because 75, 76, 77, that's when you have albums like Family Reunion, you got Teddy Pendergrass's first solo album. You got Wake Up Everybody around that time. So mm -hmm. they're really like starting to peak as songwriters. So mm -hmm. Joy Yourself is sort of like that great amalgamation of like soul and pop that was happening. So mm -hmm. yeah, it is straightforward more so than Blame It on the Boogie, which I think is a little bit, has a little bit more bite to it just in terms of the funk. You know, it's really a funky yeah. record. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. It's definitely more interesting to me. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. So we get to I know this song that you got to talk about this song and how it's so personal to you. And this has yeah. pushed me away because this is one of my favorite Michael vocals, period. So yes, tell us why this song is so important to you. Wow. Okay. So Push Me Away, uh, which is credited to all five members of the Jacksons. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful ballad. Um, they used to, this. They perf it was never a single, but they performed it a lot on television. So when they performed it on Soul Train and American Bandstand, um, Michael would do it solo. But it's a gorgeous, gorgeous record. Very melancholy. And it speaks to me just because when I first heard it, it was at a point in my life where, you know, I was like subconscious about liking girls and, you know, and being wrapped up in these sort of situations. And just the lyric of, you know, don't you know these dreams I wish could be the real you and me? I come running back to you, but you push me away. I internalized it by saying, Oh, I'm trying to be with you. I'm trying to come to you to so we can come together, but you keep keeping me at arm's length. That mm -hmm. spoke to me a lot as a 12, 13 year old kid that was trying to get girls to like me, trying to get connections with girls. And just Michael, it's the first time we hear Michael's falsetto, like really, like fully. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's very, it's not quite as prominent as it would get in the next two years, but it's it's a it's a tearjerker yes and the line that you said the, the way he held that don't you know don't you know don't you know oh i can't i he can't even say like it without matches. like start to like, like tear up <laughs> oh <laughs> just that oh, it's it's, I wish could be the real you like does that the, yeah. that little that little yeah, that's, <laughs> yes. oh. And then, yeah, I just like when he just say the tears, the pain, reality. Like, mm -hmm. that right there. I just like because Mike sounds so, like, his voice sounds so, like, it. you connect with it. Like, it's just, that's why I love it. And I don't see a lot of people talk about Push Me Away at all. Like, at all. I don't see a lot of people talk. I think I saw Matt, I think you. On your timeline, you talked about it, but yeah. I was like, I love the way Michael sounds because he sound you. You hear his voice so clearly on this, you know what I mean, and you connect to him so much. And it's just, I wish we could have had like a live performance where he's not lipping because Soul yeah. Train he lips, and also American Bandstand he lips. But we've never gotten like a performance where he's actually just singing, and I'm like. Oh, I wish, like, I wish, like, he could have went on Soul Train, like, Aretha and Patty and all them, because you know they, they didn't lip when they went on that shit. Right. Patty well, ain't lipping for nobody. Insistence. That was their insistence, because what happened was, see, Don Cornelius, um, he was a little skin flint, uh, among other alleged things, but we'll keep that for another time. Okay. But, um, <laughs> but he basically said, that it was too expensive to mm -hmm. finance live performances on Soul Train. And since he was the sole owner of Soul Train and a lot of it was coming out of his budget, he had to cut corners by having people lip sync and he could only get away with doing live performances once in a blue moon. So that was unfortunate because getting, I mean, 
if, if if I had a nickel for every song I wish Michael or his brothers would have done live, you're like, I'd be a very rich man. I mean, from You Push Me Away to um, Later On on Triumph, Time Waits for No One, you know, stuff like that, that I wish we could have gotten live performances of. I remember I was at the Apollo for the Jackson's uh, reunion tour in, in 2010 and uh and they performed push me away it was just marlon tito jermaine and jackie i thought i was gonna just like i thought i was gonna like lose it i was like oh my god and they did and they did all the rare stuff like they did heaven knows i love you girl they did man of war on that tour they did show me the way to go on there um but but push me away and 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 shout out to tito because he has a nice plaintive little guitar solo that he has in there yes, that's yes. really really like i said it's very subtle but it's actually got a lot of musicianship in it and i really enjoy uh that particular solo from him uh on the, the little bridge of that song oh yeah oh yeah and then it's just the strings and the horn like the, the horn, horn is not horn. that loud like it's there but it's like the strings man it's just Oh, it's there, it's, you know, I tell you, I'm, I'm like, I like sometimes for the horns to be way, way in the back. Yes, sometimes, you do. Yeah, for some songs like that gives you what you need. It doesn't need to be this bad, you know. Right, right, and it's and it's not. It's just enough, and the strings is just enough, and Mike is just gliding it, and like you said, Matthew T Tito doing his quick little solo in it you know what i mean like again you're sh now these guys are really being artists on this album yo like they're writing the songs they're composing these songs like it's just it's them you're learning them as artists you know what i mean and again i just love the way michael sounds on it that's why it's one of my favorites from him you know what i mean even though this is not his song it's i mean it, it, well yeah it is but <laughs> i mean you know what i mean at the end of, it's just him and he just sounds so clear on it and that's why I just like push me away I posted this on my Instagram maybe about a couple of months ago and I posted it when he did it on Soul Train even though I had to clip it a little bit because y'all know Instagram be acting stupid now so I had to clip it a little bit but it's just like and he just sits so still you know what I'm saying and he's just letting the music take him and that's what I just like I just uh I would have just loved to just see this song being created and just to be in there just to see how mike was feeling because you felt him because you know what i'm saying you got people in your life that's just trying to push you away and it's like hello i'm here what are you doing you know what i mean yeah. like why are you trying to push me away you know what i'm saying so yeah i'm it's a favorite of mine i can go on this song all day long if you let me i'm sorry <laughs> oh god oh man so the things I do for you. Things I do for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you talked about I horns. Learned. This is another song with great, great horns on it. Yes, God. Um, just that. that. That's some great, great horn work in there uh, for that record. Yes, um, God. Shout out to Thomas Clay Washington. Yes, God. Oh, yes. <laughs> what <laughs> listen to me like yo I was like who is playing this horn on this and that's when I've had to go back with a lot of notes because I felt like it was all them because I was like oh nah this is all them I don't need to see who did it and when I started looking I was like wait a minute you got Greg Hayes on this you got freaking you know what I'm saying uh, Thomas Clay Washington you know what I mean you got the Costa on there like all these people like on this record yeah. and this, when I hear this record, first of all, I be wanting to click clack down the Soul Train line when I hear this. I'm sorry. But <laughs> but when I hear this, I'm like, Michael was foreshadowing what he was given, what we was going to get on Off the Wall. Mm -hmm. Because I like when he, you know, when it gets to the break, he like, take it over. And then he does a little ad lib that he does the same one on Working Day and Night. Working Day and Night. Yeah. Take it over. And this is the first, even... Yes, that's the first time we get the three he's that. I mean, yeah. I just, but that's the first time we get those three he's. Yes, um, in the in the Jackson canon is on things I do for you. Yes, it's a very pivotal pivotal moment. But I just love um, 
this is such a unique composition mm-hmm. and just from a melodic standpoint um and like i said michael's singing on it is great you know particularly like in the verses that am i in a bad situation you know it's just like he's really singing very high in his um with his chest voice um and just having that umph and that yeah. hefty power behind it most mm-hmm. people that sing that high within their natural voice you know it gets a little thin but michael's voice is still very strong because he's <laughs> still carrying that power that he had when he was a kid and learning the things he learned from stevie the things he learned from marvin and all those people from motown yeah. um, and all the tricks of the trade on that one and um you mentioned polino de costo who yes. was great i know michael said that um they hired him because they felt that randy's um conga playing was too conventional and polino was his is much more intricate and interesting yeah. so oh, that's yeah. why they got him to sort of tag team with randy on that one i also like the baseline it's like funky the- oh yeah nathan watts man he's just and and he's all over the triumph album too um but he's a great great bassist you know from all his stuff with stevie wonder the stuff mm-hmm. on uh the this is nisi album um people forget he co-wrote um free for her for that record yes, he did. Yep. and so an excellent excellent basis um from the motown canon and you know what i learned from your episode on, on get off the fence y'all said he was kind of going at his brothers in this record mm, yeah, a little bit you know <laughs> I was, and y'all made me go back to the lyrics and i was like you know what? They got a point. Like, that's <laughs> like the shit that I'm doing for y'all. Like, mm-hmm. stop playing. Maybe that's why he's so aggressive. So, he meant that thing. So, Michael's, yeah, Michael's, like, people might interpret Michael's way of talking about it. It's just like, like, yeah, guys, it's like, I'm doing a lot for you and, you know, I'm pulling the weight here and you can pull a little bit more weight. But if you talk to the brothers, particularly Tito, things I do for you as a direct, um, inspiration from Catherine Jackson, their mother, mm-hmm. uh, because she was so polite and so forgiving a lot of the time, you know, that was a direct sort of inspiration for some of the lyrics on that song. Because uh, okay. so, I mean, the, the lyric that stands out to me is the things I do for you in return, do the same for me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, just, it goes, it goes to, it goes back to the song jam. When Michael said, I told my brother, don't you ask me for no favors. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Michael is real slick with his shit. Like, you got to catch it. You know what I'm saying? That's why we got a show called Catch That, because we catch it. So <laughs> I'm, saying, yeah. I'm just saying, because Mike got some slick, and I'll be like, Yo, what? I used, I used to, so, so people love to pair Mike and Prince, right? I'll right. say, Prince is the king of shade. But Michael is the king of side eye. <laughs> yeah, that good, good one. I like that. I like that. Mike's like side that. eye game is like serious. Very, like when yeah. he when he did at Liza Minnelli with. <laughs> you gotta watch. You gotta watch. If, if for those of you out there, yeah. go watch Spike Lee's documentary about the Off the Wall album. There's oh a point. God where an interviewer is asking him around the Destiny album about how they felt about their legacy. And Michael gave him the biggest side eye. I thought, I thought he was good. <laughs> he was going to just unload on him. <laughs> and then I love, cause you know, Stephanie Mills was like, yo, Michael ain't no punk. Y'all keep thinking like this soft image that you get. She was like, he was not soft. Like, at all you know this is something that which i think we will get into with uh that's what you get for being for being polite you know what i mean we're gonna kind of get there because he kind of had to be this person he really didn't want to be and it's just kind of a lot you know what i mean so michael was just he was hard but at the end of the day like you said his side eyes was nothing to play with that gary indiana came out like a mug you know what i'm saying <laughs> like he like he's not soft you know what i mean but yeah this song is a favorite of mine because i just like to dance to it it's just it feels good it just makes you want to groove you know what i mean so i i really like it and like musically 
the song, you got everybody, all these key players on it. Mm. What? I was like, yeah. Yeah, I just I love, I love, you mentioned Nathan Watts already, but just like, like I said, in the breakdown, just all the boom, 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 you know, all that stuff that like Thunder Thumbs would do on Off the Wall later um, and the stuff that he was doing with the Brothers Johnson, you know, it was kind of a prelude to what we would get with that stuff. So a lot of a, a great stuff with that. And and that song live is even better because that was my oh. first introduction to that song because I had the Jackson's live album before yeah. I had Destiny. I had it on cassette because I won a um a cost I got well sorry I got second place in a costume contest oh, in yeah. my seventh eighth grade dance because there was a Venezuelan neighbor that I had that just wore her regular garb and she won first place so I'm still salty about that. <laughs> well, my mother made me a Moses costume with a staff and a beard and a robe and everything and I got second place but I used that ten dollar gift certificate to buy the Jacksons live on cassette tape not knowing about how tax worked because it was $10 and the tape said $99.99. I'm like, oh, I'll get a penny back. And my mom just laughed at me talking because she Aww. knew I didn't know about tax <laughs> when I was 12 years old. But that was I my do, introduction to that song was the live album. I do like when he did it on the Bad Tour. Yeah, the first leg of the Bad the Tour. The first leg, yes. Because the first leg of the Bad Tour is basically the Victory Tour uh, set list. Um, so he does he does things I do for you on there. He does lovely one on there. Uh, I mean, he kept Heartbreak Hotel after the first leg, but um, but yeah, it's basically that victory tour show because he ended it with Shake Your Bite onto the ground and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah, because y'all <laughs> that episode y'all definitely gave that uh victory album a lot of fever. <laughs> Ooh, look, man, it's. <laughs> Yeah, I said that like you don't get that album a whole lot. I don't know, it ain't food. about me. It ain't about me. It's about me. <laughs> look, look, look. Victory had its moments. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, it did. It, it yeah. did. I like I said, I really love torture. Um, I really like state of shock. You know, body is a great, great track. Um, it's funky, but you know, it's it's pretty good. We get to shake your body down to the ground. Yeah. I have a confession. Uh oh. If you're going to tell it, you got to tell I it. I think all. I already know where this is going to go. <laughs> I already know where this is going to go. I didn't like this song at first. I did not. I did not at all. I, I did not like this song at all at first. Now I do. I love the record. Like when I first heard it, I was just like, okay. Cool. You know what I'm saying? Like that's how I felt. I was like, all right, cool. And then I I felt like this was the song that I felt like they got a lot of their this is their gamble and huff influence to me. Cause if you listen to I feel the Philly soul in it because if you listen to Teddy's get down, get funky, get loose, it has the same rhythmic pattern. And it has the same thing. And I was just like, oh, okay. This is them getting their influences from Gamble and Hub. Okay, obviously that's going to happen. You know what I mean? And then with me doing my research and realize this is the big song and this is the song that really pushed the album to really sell, I was like, and y'all left Blame on the boogie on the floor that's why i was like y'all some bull like it started getting real personal with me and that's why i was like man fuck this song i was like <laughs> i was like man this song blaming on the boogie mad better than this how do y'all gonna come on yo like but in the end of the day then now that i'm old i love the record like i'm in it like you know what i'm saying like i'm in it but as a kid this joint used to play i'll be like nah turn this off i'm good you know it's funny you mentioned the the Gamble and Huff influence on this record. What's interesting in is is the fact that, you know, it's basically just the same groove for like eight minutes, which is a very much like um, a very famous Gamble and Huff cover that came out a couple of years ago, years before that, which was um, Third World's take on Now That We Found Love. That's very much a do 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 with not too many changes. You know, you know, shake it by down to the ground, 
very very a lot of tension a lot of dissonance it's really really different for um a disco track you know it it kind of it almost sort of you know predates what we would hear with hip hop records a little bit later in terms of just taking that just that one groove part and then just repeating it over and over and over again so it's possible that everything that was going on with in the Bronx was sort of bleeding into what was going on in disco. True. Very true. Yeah. Very true. This, this was one of those songs. It just had me at hello because I just, I love the intro. Like a lot of time I'll play it and I'll start, you know, for like 30 seconds and I started back over because I just love how it comes in. It's just. <laughs> that Greg feeling Hayes, man, on that piano, <laughs> man, <laughs> piece. You're like you about to really. Like it's not a, just the piano either. He's the one the that bass. came up with the, the drum, the drum loop. Oh, oh okay. So that. Oh, okay. So that's actually three different drum takes because no one could play his beat with just one kit. So those are. So those are three different kits or three different takes. Damn, I didn't know drums. that. Yeah, it's very yeah. No one could play it until they got with Jonathan Moffat, um, their road drummer. He mm -hmm. actually played it because he thought it was one drummer, but it was three different drummers or three different drum takes. Holy shit! Yeah, and the feel that the drums give it is another thing that's a big difference from blaming on the boogie. Like I don't know, it it like you're like I don't see how people didn't get on that, but. Yeah, they're both up tempos, but they they sound different. You know, it's just it's a lot of it is the um, you know, it's funny the fact that "Shake It Back Down to the Ground" is that one groove pretty much for the whole song, mm -hmm. but in terms of the vocal arrangement, it's there's a lot of intricacies going on. You know, I don't know what's gonna happen to me, but I do know that I love it, and then I do know <laughs> that I watch <laughs> Let's dance, let's shout, shake your butt. There's a lot going on vocally yeah. that makes up for just the simplicity of the beat. Um, so I think that's one of the things that makes it so exciting is the fact that there's there's so much intricacy and complexity to the vocal arrangement on top of this very simple rhythm arrangement. And I think it's so about those two songs. What's so masterful? Those are like those are million dollar hooks. Like, like everybody knows the, you know, the chorus and song. Like, dance, cha, cha. You know, like, it's very sunlight. Well, Even you know, if it's straight thievery. Yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Even, look, look, it's been said a million times. Quincy Jones has said it. Sting has said it. Good artists um, are inspired by things. Great artists steal things. <laughs> so you know for 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 those of you out there you know this doesn't take away from michael and randy who who composed the song but mm -hmm. go and listen to got to give it up by marvin gay absolutely and he got there's a refrain let's sing let's shout getting funky what it's all about that's that is a straight lift from that into yeah. let's dance let's shout Shake wow, about, yo! Yeah. This came out during the blurred lines time or during uh, uptown funk time. There'd be three or four different <laughs> songwriters. <laughs> I'd shake it by it down to the ground. But like I said, no shade because every everybody does it. I mean, yes. there's only twelve notes. Yes, yeah. And it's like it's a lip, it, but I hear this song. I don't think about that song. I mean, it, it, but that's what makes it so that's great. The, it's the yeah, fact that agreed. you don't think of it because they're able to take it and and make it their own. I mean, that's basically how everything works anyway from music, you know? Mm -hmm. Just take a little bit of something you heard and then manipulate it just enough so it sounds like you, even if it's, you know, something that's totally from something else. I mean, Michael was very famous for, was deceptively famous for that. Um, mm -hmm. There's a song called "Chain Is a Groupie" by uh, Sly and the Family Stone, and there's a and it goes, "Chain is a groupie. She's always with the band. Every musician's f f um, biggest fan." He took that little line 
every musician's fan after the curtain comes down for Dirty Diana. So it's just those wow. little things that you, pluck, <laughs> that you put in there. You know what I'm saying? So, Holy shit. <laughs> That's Jay, our favorite song. Oh. Try me to try try my life one more time on this screen, girl. <laughs> he, he this song and I love it. He hates Dirty Diana. <laughs> oh, oh, come on now. That's a like I said, let's not let's not deviate too much from Destiny, but Dirty Diana is a great track. Great. Oh, that's so nice. Um <laughs> <laughs> well, getting back to what we were talking about, <laughs> take your body down to the ground <laughs> is an amazing song. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> oh, you know, but, and then uh, I yeah. was hyped when um B when I went to uh the Renaissance tour and how she used it for the break my soul part. So I was mm -hmm. like sitting there, she like da -da 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 and I'm like, oh shit. I'm like, did she think of that? Hmm. <laughs> I like, did she? <laughs> I look well, behind. I don't want it, no problems. Whoever thought of it, they kudos to them. Whether it was they Beyonce, kudos to them. Whether it was Dream, whether it was whoever was the MD, whoever thought right. of that, right. bravo. Because right, bravo. Because right. That's the right. that's another great thing about Jackson's records and Michael records is the the brass. You know, whether mm -hmm. it was Jerry Hay. Or Tom Tom eighty four, they had a lot of great, great, just like very instantly recognizable brass sections and shake it by down to the ground. Maybe the most recognizable um, horn line in the entire album. You know, you remember that almost as much as anything else on the record. Yes, you do. Yes, yes. They had a video for this. No, they 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 basically they like performed it like on American Bandstand. I mean, they had yeah. a promo video where they're performing um, live. Okay, um, so that technically counts. But like in terms of videos, the only video they really had was "Blame It on the Boogie." Mm -hmm. Wonder why? See, see what I'm saying? Well, videos weren't a thing like back then. That's what they were called. They were called promos. Promos. Yeah, it was before there was actually a place where you could put videos on TV and watch them. Yeah. You know, it's basically just something that like they would send to, you know, music shows, you know, in order to, you know, get the word out about the song. Right. You know, the Beatles started it back in the 60s when they would make promo videos for songs like Paperback Writer and Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane. Then it went into rock and roll music with you know, Bohemian Rhapsody, Rhapsody and yeah, theirs, and 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 them doing their promos, and mm -hmm. and that became the thing. Once MTV decided to have a twenty four hour network that had nothing but videos, um, that's when people started to pay more attention to making videos for the sake of making videos, rather than mm -hmm. it just being something to push a particular song. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Cause I'm like, damn, this song was so big, and I'm thinking, and blaming on the boogie had a video, but like you said, videos wasn't that popular. Yeah, no. it was just for promo shit. So it was like, I right, send this to them, and that's it. You know what I mean? So I mean, the song was huge. So, I but mean, the fact that, that in blaming on the boogie that they even decided to put that little special effect thing that they had in there, you know, I mean, I was, laugh every it, time I see that. It, every time I watch it, it's like, oh, this reminds me of my second year of college when they taught us about editing and like, oh, here's a star wipe. Boop. <laughs> That's awful. No. That's awful. I shouldn't have said that. No, no, you're fine. I love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In my oh, life God. right now. You, yeah, man. Then, then we come to the title track, right? Yes, yep. indeed. Yeah. Oh, be me. Okay. <laughs> this is another. This this is another. I love this song. This is this is another song that they would sing, on the um sort of late night TV circuit. Uh -huh. Um, and they I think they sang it live once on one of these shows. It was one of those shows where like they're dressed up in like snow gear. <laughs> And I know they also like sang it like on like Don Kushner's rock show and uh, Jermaine came. Yes. With them. Yes. 
Yeah, that I love that. I love that performance. I love when they uh when Jermaine came out and it was just like a moment, you know what I'm saying, for them. So it was kind of joint. It's you know, I love happiness is always material things. Let me be me and let me be free. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Yeah, yes, go. Yeah. Well, should I up and fly away so fast and free? Fancy free. Come on. Nobody can change my mind. Yeah. Huh. Here's a destiny. I call it me. Oh, yeah. I I love that bridge. That's probably my favorite bridge on the song is, mm. is Destiny. It's oh. excellent. And then, once again, Michael's singing in that upper register in his full voice. Um, that's really, really powerful stuff. And then just I love the um just the sentiment of that song. You yeah. know, the whole idea of, you know, the simple life and then just like it because it, it makes me think that there was a time where, you know, we wanted to be famous, but then they lost all their anonymity. And so they kind of long to have that back. So destiny is sort of a great way to, to talk about the fact that, you know, there's a time where I don't want to be famous anymore. And I do want to go back to just living a simple life and just being myself and not having to worry about, you know, being somebody else for someone else, which is great foreshadowing for the next song. Yes. Yes, for sure. Great foreshadowing for just life. True, true. Okay. And and I feel like this song, you can play this song now and it sounds fresh. You know what I'm saying? Like, especially what's going on, speaking of B and what she doing right now. You know what I'm saying? And got everybody talking. You can play this record now. And it will still sound fresh to me. And you know what I mean? And it's just that acoustic guitar on this is just, ah, speaking of somebody playing, learning, playing the guitar, sis, you should play this. <laughs> One song at a time. One, oh, one song at a time. One song. I'm sorry. I'm getting in. I'm getting in. Yes, yes. But I, and then it's just the last two minutes, just like the horn is so soft in the back, too. You know, like you said, at least it's not that loud. You know what I mean? But it's in there and it gives the song a little bit of depth to me. So I like this joint for real, for real. The words is is lyrically is amazing. It's just just a great song. I, I, I love the I rock, the like the rock influenced outro. With the little horns, like you were saying. That, yeah. That because because it's so unexpected like based mm. on what you were hearing from the song previously. So yeah. when it comes in, it's just like, ooh, okay. You know, that, that that's yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that really showed like the depth of their um, arranging and the way that they were crap and they're producing, you know, yeah. and it showed like, yeah, now we're gonna show like the backtrack a little bit to shake your bite out of the ground. If you listen to the demo of that song, you hear Jackie Jackson at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope the BGs hear this shit. <laughs> when I heard that, I died. I was like, oh, that, like, <laughs> I could not believe it. I was like, this, it's like, you now look into when artists make these songs, it's like, yeah, I want somebody to hear this shit. Let's see what they think of our shit. You know what I mean? And at this time, the BGs are killing it. You know what I'm saying? Like, they eating it up with Saturday Night Fever. So it's like, yeah, let's see the BGs hear this shit. Like, let's see mm -hmm. how this goes. You know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. And you know what? What I like about at the end with the little rock part is how it goes out and comes back in so dramatic. It's like that brown. Oh yeah, the little crescendo. It's so dramatic. Yes. Or, or sport sando as 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 they say in music theory. That little no. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Mrs. Weber from Wellwood Middle School. I was paying attention <laughs> in fifth and sixth grade music class. Mezzo forte, forte, fortissimo. <laughs> <laughs> and, this, and this song too shows just how musical it was because it starts out like a country folk record 
Then the beat comes in, so it gives you that R&B funk there. And then you get the rock. It was just like, like you said, their production and how they was crafting and composing their songs was just, just amazing. And, it's in, and this song is one of the ones, it's like, damn, their musical influences is nothing to play with. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Destiny, great song. Great song. Uh -oh. Bless his soul. Ah, this is another one of them ones, man. One of the ones, yes. Another I one of them yes. ones. Yes. And, and, yes. and listen, I got it, like, and, and you alluded to it a, few, a second ago. They really, like, went out of their way to make sure that the intros to each of these songs had great signatures and had and had a lot of gravitas. So yeah, with yeah. Less is So That, do, 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 you know, like Quincy said that one of the things, great things about Michael's songwriting is because he understood drama. And there's a lot of dramatics when it comes to the introductions to a lot of these songs on this album. And Bless a Soul is no exception, especially with those strings and how they come in. Just oh, beautiful, beautiful stuff. That's that's some more Gamble and Huff influence in there. That's true. That's very true. Because them strings kind of like touches you, man. And, and And then lyrically, it's just like, it's just like, you can't please everybody, yo. Like, you just can't, you know what I mean? And, and you gotta, what What did Jackie say? Uh, how do you say, cause I wanna say Something soon to come over you. You just can't please the world and yourself. Gotta start doing what's right for you. That's it. Being happy yourself. Oh, uh, lyric, what? Mm -hmm. uh. You know what, this song, I it kind of bores me until it gets to about the three, 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 fifteen minute mark when that good that, that nice little guitar riff come in. Oh, the life you're it, it, leading is. And then the song comes alive for me before it's kind of, and it's not even like I dislike it, but it's just right. Like, and then that, and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's I love something, it. yeah. I love. Uh, once again, one of the, the you I touched on the lyrics in in my song in my sorry I touched on the lyrics in my um my article about Destiny uh, Jackson yeah. cries yeah where I talk about you know this song and just the whole idea you know like because because then you really understand like where Michael's coming from you know um I where he says sometimes I cry because I'm confused is this the fact of being used. There is no life for me at all. So I give myself a beck and call. It's kind of like he's saying, I can't be who I am without messing it up for somebody else. So it's better for me to do for others, even if it's not helping me. And I relate to that so much, mm. so, so much. So many people can, you know, mm -hmm. losing your identity for the sake of trying to please other people and fit into their ideas of what you should be or how they should be serving you. That is just gospel right there. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Oh my God. That hit home for me in 2010. I was like, I'm going to start living for me. You know what I mean? And start living for other people and what they want me to live and all this kind of stuff. And it felt so damn good. You know what I mean? And these are one of the songs that actually helped me out with that. And it was just like, that's why when I read your arc, I was like, I get it. You know what I'm saying? Like when you said, when you talked about this, right, I was like, I get it. This is where I was in 2010. So I was like, I get it. Like he is somebody that gets it like me. You know what I mean? Because it's like the way music really touches me and it speaks for me, it does everything for me. So anything that I'm going through, I need a song to kind of really help me. And during this time, it was Janelle Monet and it was this song here. And I just remember, I was like, I can't be living for everybody else because then I ain't living for me. So mm -hmm. I can't do this. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, Bless his soul, bless mine. You know what I mean? I have to bless me. So this song is very powerful for me. So it's very, very, a very powerful song for me, for real. And mm -hmm. did, did, did I hear I could be a shady? You know what? It um I I know what this song makes me think. Uh -huh. It it 
it sounds like a um in the beginning it's like a tv theme song it it just it's just giving me big hill street blues like it's giving me yeah. very big hill street blues and i, I just see. said that about another song we talked about recently yes. that gave me that i can't remember what song it was um shoot it was yeah, just a couple of episodes ago too <laughs> yeah it, it does have that kind of like moonlighting kind of vibe a little yeah. bit now that you yeah. say that just a little bit very very well, like i said with that, just you just gotta give me a few minutes and then when, when that part comes in then it just gives a song more life to me and then i can yeah, you, yeah but swap out i the also intro. do agree with y'all about the lyrics though i do i do love the songwriting on this song oh man i man. have to stick around for the uh for a song that bores me in the beginning because i like what the song is saying right Right, right. Yeah, like like I was talking to somebody the other day about um about Beyonce's self titled album and how some of the songs kind of like meander for me a little bit or they don't really grab me melodically, but lyrically they're really really poignant. Like like Pretty Hurts is probably like a great example of that, where it's sort of like it's not really as compelling like melodically for me, but just thematically it's just like yo she's really spitting right mm. here so i get it from from that sense but just musically i've always um loved this song from beginning to end even the just the little um wistful ad-libs at the end hey ha 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 so yeah, yeah i love that too Jackson said that the Isley brothers were a big influence around this time when they were recording this record too. So mm -hmm. the Isley brothers had a, a um had a knack for being a tad wistful in some of their uh harmonizing. Mm -hmm. And um, and if I may, um I have to I have to mention this. Um like I said, this is no shade, but one of the things that definitely separate the fact that it's the Jacksons and not the Jackson Five obviously is the absence of Jermaine and Jermaine severely compromised their harmonic ability. Yes. And so you get a lot more unison singing with the Jacksons during the epic years. And when they do do harmonies, they have a lot of short notes. They're real, real quick because even though their har harmony was good, it just wasn't the same without Jermaine there too. So they used it as as an advantage on Destiny more to do more unison singing rather than it being a detriment on previous records. Yes. Yep. Yep. I'm glad you said that because, yeah, the Motown days, their harmonies were so tight. Oh, because Jermaine was there. You get to this, you like, uh ha, -huh, okay, all right. You could tell Jermaine is definitely, and it's like you said, it's no knock because it's like, it's quick, done. You know what I mean? With them, they you used to hear their harmonies used to just spread throughout the record. With this, with mm -mm, they not doing that because you're missing them. You're out. missing that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh God. But yes, I love that record. Love it. Love it. And then and then we get to all night dancing. That's church. That is yeah. church. Straight up. Church. Straight up church, like right from the beginning. I was like, go ahead, Greg. Greg, what? You know what the song makes me think about in the beginning? What? Earth, Wind, and Fire. Mm. Is it giving me big Earth, Wind, and Fire? Like Earth, Wind, and Fire, like. Yeah, I I feel more, I think this is more of like, like you were talking about Blood, Sweat, and Tears earlier, the guy from that group, Bobby Columbia, that's his name. He was the drummer wow. for Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Yeah. And he was, um, you know, he was an A&R over at uh, Epic. He was like the supervising producer for this record. So th they had a lot of like organ and things of that nature that was influenced on this one. So I think that a lot of that Blood, Sweat, and Tears sort of like folk soul thing with a lot of organs and stuff that's like like think of like like vanilla fudge and groups of like that back in the day they were using a lot of like funky organ rock sort of influences back then so all night dancing is kind of like a cousin or into into that type of playing yeah and you can tell mike is having fun with this he's having fun with this record 
you can feel it. Like he's enjoying it, and the and the musicians is just kind of going off to me. It's like them having just a jam session with it, and Mike is in there, and he just doing whatever. He's just following they lead. You know what I'm saying? And I just think, I think it's just, and then you say, you know, at the end when he say, ain't nobody business but mine. We know where that goes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. so, oh, this is another, this is another one where like for me, uh, the real draw is that little breakdown, that found out down. down, down. But, yeah, you get that, like that breakdown, that found out down down, 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 down. That's like the real, like, that's, yeah, that's my, my... <laughs> yeah, I'm here for it. Yeah, I love this song. This, that's, yes. It's, it's, it's one of my, yeah, it's one of my favorites on the record. Oh, mine too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. One of mine too. And then you like a groove, so, duh. I love, I love a groove. <laughs> you love a groove. Baby. <laughs> like, yeah. if you have a groove, you good. You know what I'm saying? So. That would be such a are you listening? Be like, I know she like that. Yeah, like, yeah, I knew All yeah. Night Dancing. I was like, yeah, at least gonna love this record. I was like, this is a favorite of mine. I know she gonna love it because it's a groove and that girl would love a groove. And you mm -hmm. ain't giving her no groove, she ain't grooving. Like, <laughs> like if you give me a groove, I'll actually excuse some other things. Oh, yeah, it's a lot of songs you have done that with. <laughs> <laughs> This is another one that like like Mike's in his high register throughout a lot of this song. He's mm -hmm. like up there from the very beginning. And he does, and sometimes they'll even go higher, but he starts high with this song and he doesn't really taper too much from it. So yeah. it's a lot, a lot of high register singing from Michael, and it doesn't give an inch. Yes. Oh, great. Agree. 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 Great song. Great song. So we at the last song, and that's what you get for being polite. Man. Mm. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> What's that? Oh no, the lyrics like no, this I I I, I can relate very heavily to this song. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is yeah. Yo, this is the one. The one. I like like literally the time I heard it. I'm like. Yeah. Oh yes. That they were already yeah. they were already my favorite group of all time by the time I got to this album. Mm. But when I got to this song, I was just like houseway. <laughs> houseway. <laughs> like it was it, it's a song that came out three and a half years before I was born, but it literally told the story of my life at that point as a young teenager and I could not handle it. I could not handle it at all. Damn. Damn. Like when you read when you wrote that in your your article, I was just like, damn. Like yeah. you never know. Like, you know what I'm saying? You and you were very personal with it. That's why I was like, and look, I'm an emotional listener anyway. So when I was reading that, I was like, yo, you want to give that a hug after this? Like you like, oh my God. I was like, yo, like, damn, like, but he, I, you know, he ended up getting out of it, you know what I mean? And what this song did for him, you know what I mean? But um, this was personal for Mike, absolutely personal. And he, I think he said he wanted people to know that he was just like everybody else with insecurities and, and he didn't want people to think, yeah, just because I got it all, I'm good. Right. That's not a true. You know what I mean? Like, and this reminds me of when he did when Mariah did outside on mm -hmm. on Butterfly. Butterfly. Yes. Or outside or daydream. Was it daydream? No, daydream. It's daydream. It's daydream? Yes. Oh, outside. Okay. You could be right. Wait a minute. No, Hold I don't on. I don't I don't know. You more Mariah. Oh, I know. And you I know should the be ashamed of myself. Of yeah, I was right. Butterfly. It is butterfly, yes. <laughs> Yeah, yes, you was right. You was right. Yeah, you was right. So it gave you that because Mariah's like, I want to give y'all insight. Y'all think I have it all. Y'all think um, no, no, not outside. Looking in, <laughs> looking in on daydream. Okay, that, that's that's what got confused. Yeah. Oh, hold hold that thought. He dropped yeah. off again. Oh, he dropped off. Yeah. 
I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pause. Okay, it. You so. Yeah, so it, that song gives me like when Mariah was doing Looking In. And like, she was letting you know, like, y'all, y'all think I have it all, but I got insecurity just like y'all. Like, y'all thinking y'all see the glitz and the glamour and all this. And it's like, yo, I'm just like y'all. And I think this is what Mike was saying, because I think he put this in his autobiography, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes, yes, and, he did. Okay, okay. He talked and about he, the fact that he wanted to let people know that he didn't live in a glass house, you know, or sorry, in a, he, I'm not phrasing, but he didn't want people to think that he lived in a golden tower. He basically That's wanted to know that, you know, I'm a, because remember, this is 1978, you know, he's 19, 20 years old when he's writing all this stuff mm -hmm. and he's going through a lot of insecurities. So this was his way to tell people like, look, I'm a music star. I'm in the show business, I'm famous, but I still have to go through the same things that you go through. So this is my way of expressing that to you. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, cause, cause, and he does it beautifully. I mean, once again, you know, he handles the crux of the lyricism because him and Randy wrote this one, the two of them. Mm -hmm. And just the whole, you know, Jack still cries day and night. Jack's not happy with his life. He wants to do this, he wants to do that. He wants to be kind, but ends up flat for love. You know, he tries so hard to give a lot. He wants to be what he is not. The fact that just those lyrics, he tries so hard to give a lot. He wants to be what he is not. You know, love's not harsh, love's not bad, but what he's doing for love is so sad. That to me was like heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely heartbreaking mm -hmm. because of the fact that he, once again, like with Bless His Soul, he's trying to fit into this idea of what other people um, are trying to make him be rather than trying to be himself. And he's losing himself in the process. You know, he's putting himself inside of this prison. That's why he says, you know, all the time getting in, but thinks he can't get out. Something's deep inside in him, eating up the pride in him. That's just... And I just, I love the way he sings that all the time getting in things he can't get out. I love that. It's, it's this, like, like I said, there's so many great uh, vocal arranging on this record that's so unique and it, it, it doesn't bore your ear when you mm. hear it, when you break it down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this, and, and to know Michael, I think this is a song that really described him. You know what I'm saying? Like, it really described him, and this is what he was really about. Like, if you really wanted to know Michael and who he really was, these are the type of songs. You know what I'm saying? That's why Man in the Mirror makes sense. That's why all these songs afterwards make sense, because it was like, he was telling us this back then. You know what I'm saying? But then we get to these, and it's like, oh, yeah, Michael's a but Michael been on this Man in the Mirror stuff way before then. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of these songs foreshadow these these other songs we got later on. You know what I mean? So, yeah. The, and the, the way to end the album like this. You know what I mean? I love how the album ends with this song. You know what I mean? It's like, we boogieing yeah. in the beginning, but now y'all gonna listen to these lyrics at the end. You know what I mean? Y'all gonna feel me at the end. I'm gonna groove with you in the beginning, how we starting it off, but y'all gonna feel me at the end. You know what I mean? You thought we was gonna end it with all night dancing. No, 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 no. We want I want you to feel me at the end. And I think that was I think it was brilliant how he ended oh, it. Oh yeah. I think I, it was it's about you, yeah. It's about me. Yeah. And every <laughs> little thing in his way. I I just love that. And and another thing we talked about that he he he's this is another un, um underused but very, very Michael Jackson ad lib that yeah. don't you know he often cry that little don't you know that's a very specific Michael Jackson ad lib because mm -hmm. he does that again yeah. in PYT I don't you know I and he writes it for Rebe in um Centipede don't you know and then he says it again and leave me alone and don't you know that, that's, that, that's <laughs> a central Michael Jackson ad lib yeah. <laughs> Matthew, you can't say the word centipede around me and JR because then we go 
we go wear you and start singing it. That's our uh... right. That's how I was like, oh God, who's gonna do it? And we gonna sing. <laughs> We're like, I, 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 I can't help it. I've been i I go back and forth. Yeah, I just you know, I like you ever, <laughs> you ever watch you ever watch Christina Aguilera sing? She's always doing every time uh -huh. she's doing a line, she's doing this. Yes. Like, I was like, what are you, George Benson? Are you playing guitar and and, <laughs> and scatting at the same time? Air guitar and right. Uh, in this case, it's one hand, so maybe she's air recording of, of or something or air fluting. I'm trying to find the note. Oh, uh, ooh. Like, hey, be nice. Be uh, nice. I'm gonna be nice. I'm gonna be nice. I love <laughs> you. Oh, I'm at least sorry. you're doing you're doing a genie thing. You're just trying to you're like. <laughs> yeah. Say all the the centipede is getting hot over there. Sarah. It sure is. <laughs> it sure is. Yeah, but but just to just just to bring it back home, I just love I love I love everything about this song because it's there's it's all the subtleties in this song. Like there's a lot of great subtle guitar playing in this record. You know, the yeah. piano really takes center stage on it, but there's a lot of great subtle guitar playing. There's a lot of great strings on here and a lot of great brass and it's very understated but intricate at the same time and interesting but it gives the vocal the space for it to do its thing because that's really the star it's not even just the vocal but the lyricism with the vocal that's mm -hmm. the star you know what yeah. i'm saying so that's yeah. why i just love this song and also if, if, if i may just bring it all home you know, you guys have been talking about my article and I, I really appreciate it. For those of you guys who are just now tuning in or who haven't been following, um, on my Substack, I wrote an article called uh, Jack Still Cries, How Destiny Saved My Life. And I get really, really personal about the fact that when I was a teenager, I was going through a lot of depression before I even knew what, de what depression was. You know, I started having a lot of, uh, my, my first bout was like suicidal ideations and things. And then my parents, God love my parents, mom, dad, I love you guys. They bought me Destiny and Victory on CD for Christmas around that time. And when I heard this album, it made me realize, wow, if they could write a song, if someone could write a song about how I'm feeling, that means I'm not the only one that feels that way. And that was such a liberating feeling for me and it just quelled a lot of these negative thoughts in my head. And then I was able to go on and try to make sense of everything. And it really started me on this path to pay more attention to music than ever. I always loved music up to that point, but after that, I became just obsessive with music in general, you know? And then that led me to find songs like What a Fool Believes by the Doobie Brothers, which told a very specific story about a high school crush that I had. It taught, then Bag Lady, Erica Badu, um, when I was in college and how that, you know, showed me about, you know, just the, the way that you have this baggage, this emotional baggage that pushes people away and how it will affect you in your life if you don't let it go. And, I probably wouldn't even be a music journalist today if it weren't for this album, which led me to those two songs, which led me to where I am today. And so I just want to just prop this album up, prop this particular song up um, to just put a nice bow on it. You know, I really, really love this song. It was a perfect way to end this album, this album called Destiny, this album in which they used the peacock to really tell people that we are about getting everyone of every color together. The message of the Jacksons and the message of Michael Jackson was to unite the people with their music when it was all said and done. And that's the reason why their music and his music and Janet's music will always be relevant to this day. It's not just because of the infectious innovative music and singing but the fact that they put a message in there for people to come together on not everybody does that they actually took that responsibility and ran with it 
and I'm forever indebted to them. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you go nowhere after that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we say, oh, good my, my drop, that's... Right, 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 right. Um, and no notes. <laughs> <laughs> Not a one. Yeah. So, now that we've concluded talking about the album, mm -hmm. we have come to my favorite part of the show, and that's the word association. And today it's going to be word album association. And I'm going to give you five different albums that came out in 1978. And you just tell me the first thought, song, memory, anything that you associate with that album. Just first thing that comes to your mind. Bet. All right. Is it cool enough? All right. So we are going to start off with... Which one I want to do first? Ashford and Simpson, is it still good to you? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, that's the word I'm that's the word that I'm associated. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> because I didn't know. It was the answer to the question. <laughs> so, that, so when I hear that album and that's and, and particularly that song, yeah. I'm like. Yes, it is so good to me. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Got me. <laughs> Daddy, yes. It's all about the delay. It's all about <laughs> the delay. When it when when you don't get it at first and then it comes back around. It's chef's kiss. <laughs> I I love the type of track of that album. Is it still good to you? Ja, I'll tell you, I will. It, it's one of my earworm songs. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's a once it's on me. I I know Jay. I'll be like, shit. Now, which which version is better, Asher and Simpson's version Ooh. or the Teddy Pendergrass version? Ooh. Um, I I listen. I probably listen to the Teddy one more yeah. than I do the Asher and Simpson one now. So it it switched places. It used to be the Ashley Simpson, and now it's the Teddy for me. Mm. Yeah, I, I I just love his vocal performance on it. Like it's yeah, it's yeah, it's perfect to me. It's a very but in the way he sings it, it's a very it's a like when Ashwin Simpson sings it, it's more of a is it still good to you as in um, the relationship, you know, the the courtship, the way that Teddy sings it. It's a very mid coital sort of situation. Mm -hmm. You know, the, is it still good to you? You know, it's like, oh, so you recorded this song while you were busy doing something else. Okay. I, <laughs> okay, I got you. <laughs> All right. Next, we're going to go. Well, speaking of Teddy's Pendergrass, Life is a Song Worth Singing. Uh, perfection. I mean, Ooh. listen. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say it just right now. This is the best Teddy Pendergrass solo album. It, it might be one of the best top to bottom albums to come out of PIR in the seventies. I mean, Ooh. it's chock full of nothing but absolute heat. You know, you have get down, get up, get down, get funky, get loose. Uh, you got it. Don't hurt now. Yeah, great, great song. You got close the door. Close the door. You got yep. somebody loves you back on that record. Yeah, it's just there's no fat on this record. There's yeah. no fat on it at all. I can agree. Oh, I, I, I definitely agree. I agree. Hold on. Damn. Damn. Oh, and um. Um, only you is on this. Record. Only you, Another, yes. A song uh, which is on my list of songs ruined by Eddie Murphy. <laughs> Think about it. Every like, if listen, I'm just gonna go down just real quick. 
Eddie Murphy ruined because because of because of delirious. You got you got you got what I need. You got what I need. Yeah, the, just in the liking him, you know. <laughs> so he ruined <laughs> that song. He ruined um To Be Loved by Jackie Wilson. So yes. what is, oh my God. Is. he I was wrong for that. He ruined he ruined sitting on the dock of the bay. Watching yes. the ships roll in, then you'll watch them roll away again. Lillian. Oh, God. I mean, he likes to add a temptation for the symphony. <laughs> I don't mind because it means that much to me. Eddie Murphy stay ruining songs. Like, yeah. Even the, Beatles, I... even the Beatles. Oh, yeah. Man, tell you something, man. <laughs> So, yeah, nice. Teddy Pendergrass, Life is a Song Worth Singing. Perfect, perfect record. Yeah. Top to bottom, only seven songs, just boom. Yeah. No fat. Right. And 78. I'm having a hard time choosing because there's so much fire. All right. Um, hmm. Oh, so, Marvin Gaye, hear my dear. So many places I could go with this one. Um, I'll I'll use a um I'll use a word from from Yasin Bey Mostef. Eavesdropping. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Good one. Eavesdropping. Good one. This whole album sounds like a conversation you're hearing in the other room that you shouldn't be hearing, but you just, it's so juicy. Yes. It's just like, ooh, this is getting a little too ratchet and a little <laughs> too personal, but I can't stop listening to it. It's it's just like, you know what I'm saying? I mean, and when he has a line, do you remember all the bullshit, baby? <laughs> he says, if you love me, how could you turn me into the police? <laughs> Chad, that's that's me and JR record. That's right low. We did an episode on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All said, right. Yes. Try to right. scare my woman and take my child. He <laughs> said, What do you what do you say? Um um, blowing coke up all up my nose, getting in and out my clothes, fooling around with midnight hoes. Like, Listen to me. <laughs> he's being a Mama little too shit. forward. Yes, a little too forward. But it's might be. Sometimes it's my all time favorite Marvin Gaye album. It's up there. That and I Want You. Those are my two favorite albums okay. by him. And okay. I go back and forth between which one I like the most. But yeah. It's like you're eavesdropping into something you shouldn't be hearing. Good one. Good one. All right. Next. Because you kind of uh, mentioned the group, Minute by Minute, the Doobie Brothers. Ooh. Um. <laughs> what, what's that? Uh. I would say uh usurp. <laughs> because it's the it's mm. it's the moment where it's the moment where it became Michael's band, Michael McDonald. That's his group at that at that moment. Because there's still there's still blemishes Absolutely. of the old duties on taking it to the streets. On taking it to the streets. Uh, they're still mm -hmm. it, they're, they're slowly transitioning. And living on the fault line, which is a very underrated album, but once we get to minute by minute, that is fully my Ab band. absolutely fully from the beginning to the end. From here to love you, minute by minute, what a fool believes. How do those fools survive? Open your eyes. Yeah, just straight up. Just that is the you know like they they have the term yacht rock. That is yeah. just a yacht rock classic Thank and you. also yeah. if i may i'm very angry that michael mcdonald and kenny loggins never did a duet album for the culture because Why never? Every, I, single yes. song, 
they wrote together was Flames from What a Fool Believes, This Is It, I Gotta Try, Heart to Heart. Every song they did together was just an utter masterpiece. They should have done the whole duet album. I never understood why they didn't do one. Like I never got why we didn't get one. And their them. voices blend together so well. Perfectly. What? Yeah. So yeah, that's that's when that's the usurp moment in the doobies where that was fully Michael McDonald's band. And then it, it kind of got a little bit oversaturated with once uh one step closer. Um and songs like Real Love on the next record, which is a great song. But mm -hmm. that real that that album is 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 a great, great record. It broke the band up briefly, but it's still, you know, nothing to bring the band back together than a number one hit. <laughs> <laughs> that part. That part. Exactly. All right. And we will end it with. Chic, say chic. Mm. Um, okay. That album makes me think of Puffy. <laughs> I know his name is Mud right now. <laughs> Actually, no, his name is Quicksand. It's not even Mud, it's Quicksand. And that's always been JR trigger word since I've known him. But just because uh, for those of you out there, um, Say Chic begins with the Chic Cheer record, which is -da 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 -da. that is the Love Like This sample for Faith Evans. Mm -hmm. So it just makes me think of all those records that Puffy basically just his copy and paste method of sampling that he would do back in the day. No shade, because they're big records, you know, like Feel So Good by Mace and stuff like that. Just purely just, you know, you know, just just cutting, okay, sing over this. I mean, yes, there's precedent for it, but I think he just went overboard with it. Yeah. So, but say shit. Yeah, he pressed the button they got credit for? Okay, yeah. <laughs> yep. It's my song now. I can turn the lights on in the studio. <laughs> Produce credit. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. But, but shout out to um, Nile Rogers and the late, great Bernard Edwards. Yes, Lord. Uh, not only great guitarists and bassists, respectively, but excellent songwriters, excellent producers. Yes. I mean, that, that record's got the Freak on it. It's got Cheat Cheer on it. I think I Want Your Love is on that yes, album. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Very, very unique record in their catalog. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, it's just a straight up, like every song just makes me think of like Puffy because just so much like Nile Rodgers and Bernard Edwards records that became big hits for Bad Boy. Like like the like um, No More 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 Problems was uh, from I'm Coming Out, which came out two years later by Diana Ross, mm -hmm. written and Produced by Nile Rodgers and Bernard Edwards, so that that it just that era of disco music and you know stuff from the late seventies that mm -hmm. got used a lot in what was coined as the shiny suit era of hip hop. So it just makes me think of that a lot, you know, as a child of the nineties. Hmm. You did it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. So, is there anything else you would like to share with our audience, or let people know how they can find you? You know, all that, all that kind of stuff. But whatever well, you want to say. Well, thank you very much. First and foremost, I'd like to start by just thanking the both of you for having me on. Like I said, I'm a big fan of of every show that you guys do. This you won't be his first time, time, though. This won't be his last time. But go ahead, talk. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm excited about the next one too. So, yeah. um, whatever it may be, but I'm mm -hmm. a big fan of your guys' shows because you guys have multiple shows. I implore all of you to listen to all their shows. Um, and thank you for shouting me out on one of your shows, the 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 the, the vault show about um, Maxwell's Embrya. Uh, yes, I like my heart. Like really, like <laughs> I, I can't say enough 
how oh, yes. that was. Thank you very much for that. So thank you. So you guys can read a big back catalog of my articles at thegrio.com. Um, you can just Google me at Matthew Allen, the Grio, the Grio one word, T-H-E-G-R-I-O. You can see my work from Ebony Magazine, even though they got rid of our bylines. And um, <laughs> no shade, not really, but you know, thanks, thanks. Um, but you can read my stuff with the Grio. You can read my stuff from Ebony. You can read my stuff from The Root. Um, you can go to my Substack, headphoneaddict.substack.com uh, to read my article, Jack Still Cries, How Destiny Saved My Life. You can also read my other entries about um, the 40th anniversary of the Thriller video where I talk about the zombie dance. Um, I have an article about um, Stevie Wonder's uh, 80s catalog called Half a Mile from Heaven. That's really, really great, um, if I do say so myself. Um, and uh, you can listen to my podcast, my season one, Get Off the Fence, the um, premier album debate podcast. And thank you guys so much for listening and shouting out. Um, basically, the format is, is that I and my I and a guest will get together and we will debate which album is better between two albums, usually from the same artist um, in five different categories. We talk about um, bookends, which is the best album opener and closers. You have an, a category about um, higher highs, which talks about the best single releases. Uh, lower lows, when each of us picks the weakest song on the other album. Um, so I'm, I'm, glad we, I'm glad I stopped doing that one in person because I was afraid I was going to get cut with a knife sooner or later. <laughs> but um, but that's lower lows. Um, then we have a, have a section about lyrical content. And then we have the X Factor, which is um, a special thing about the album as well as a closing argument. Mm -hmm. So we, I, I have eight episodes from season one that you guys can listen to. You can go to um, headphoneaddict.substack.com. You can also go to um, Apple Podcasts. You can also go to Spotify, Get Off the Fence um, podcast. We debate Stevie Wonder's Inner Visions versus Songs That Kill Life. Ooh. Jackson's Destiny versus Triumph, Janet's Rhythm Nation versus Control. We do Quincy's Back on the Block versus uh, The Dude. Dude. Uh, we we do uh, Hear My Dear versus um, I Want You. Um, I did uh, Commons B versus Like Water for Chocolate. And we Ooh. also had a special one where we had two different artists against each other. We had New Edition's Home Again versus... Um, Black Street's Another Level album uh, because they're great albums by two R&B groups from the 90s and they came out on the same day. Uh-huh. We know. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, um, and our, uh, our our dear mutual friend, Mark Chappelle, I do um, an episode with him, Mary J. Blige's What's a 4 one versus My Life. That's all season one. Um, right now, I'm still um, in pre-production mode for season two. Uh, for um, Get Off the Fence. So I hope you guys uh, go back and listen to it and stay tuned. Uh, you guys can follow me at Headphone Addict on Twitter, at Headphone Addict on Instagram, at Headphone Addict on Thread, at Headphone Addict on now on TikTok now. I'm going to start doing TikTok soon. Um, right now, it's just, you know, posts of my, my Substack articles. Um, but yes, uh, you can find me there too. Um, and if anyone's looking for a music writer, uh, a panelist, a panel moderator, uh, I've been on Unsung um, this year, which was great. Uh, you can find me on episodes. So was. Talk about a living color. You better. I was <laughs> like, he's better. I was like, yes. I was like, you. I was like, represent. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, so I'm on the um, Best in Black seasons. So I talk about Black athletes. I talk about uh, film pioneers, particularly Quincy Jones. And then I'm on the television episode where I talk about In Living Color. Um, and I'm also, um, if you can check and find it somewhere, if you subscribe to Reels, um, I'm in an episode of Breaking the Band uh, about the Jackson 5 and their breakup. Um, so if you want to go and find that in the Reels channel, 
you can find that there as well. Okay. So yeah. On it. Excellent. That, yes. And uh you guys can email me at M C Allen, M C A L L E N 8204 at AOL.com. Don't laugh. AOLs, I still use it. It still works. So I don't want to hear it. As I, I know that's say, right. All of you guys out there in internet land, it 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 works for me. I not a one glitch, not one stolen identity, knock on wood. So <laughs> so you can email me there once again if you need me to write for your EPK, if you need me to write for your website, um, if you're a publication that needs a writer, you know, <laughs> um, I offer my services out to you guys. But in the meantime, yes, go to uh, subscribe to headphoneaddict.substack.com. Yes. Well, we thank you so much. And we thank our viewers, our cousins, our family. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, man, I love y'all. <laughs> Especially the folks in the live chat. It's always a very good time. And it's yes. just a go reunion. It's well, it's on Sunday, it's our church. So um Right. <laughs> right. So we thank y'all for, for, for keeping things going. We are growing and thank y'all for especially the day ones. Appreciate y'all. Yes. Yes. And we will catch y'all on the next catch that. Peace. Peace. That was <laughs>